Officer, uh, is it okay if I park here? Greetings, my wrecky strange migrant. I make pleadings to the celestial being that your pilgrimage thus far has been fruitful. But be not bedeviled, for the pain inquiry of your hallowed locust is indeed a rightful sanctuary for your ramshackle convenience. So is that a yes? You got it! Come on! Get off all day! Move along! Move along! Whew. Some pretty high standards for traffic cops in Washington, D.C. Luckily, I have my trusty Webster's Dictionary that I keep in the Hummer at all times. What was that word he said? Uh, rakish? Transponder? That oh, doesn't matter. You ever wondered about this book, Webster's Dictionary? Who was Webster and how come he knew so many words? Well, it was published by a man named Noah Webster. Noah Webster, Webster's Dictionary, get the connection or do I have to spell it out for you? <laughs> Anywho. Noah Webster was an American lexicographer or dictionary creator. He was also a textbook author, a Bible translator, a writer, and an editor. And his impact on America was long-lasting and very profound. Now, his dictionary has been updated several times to allow for words like internet and gigabyte and flowetry. Actually, I just made flowetry up. Not even a real word, dogs. Americans use Webster's Dictionary all the time, but they rarely stop to consider the immense amount of work and labor that went into creating it. Now, when Webster first published his dictionary in 1806, dictionaries were rare, and this was America's first attempt at creating her own. Now, he's also known for impacting America in many other ways. He was a soldier during the American Revolution. He was a writer, an educator, a legislator, and a judge. But he's still mostly known for publishing the dictionary and giving us the meaning of countless words. We take that for granted. Take this simple newspaper, for instance. If I come across a word I don't understand, all I have to do is look it up and figure it out. And you're not going to believe this. But today, October 16th, is Noah Webster's birthday. It really is. He was a bright, studious lad. And in 1774, when he was only 16 years old, Noah Webster entered Yale College. Now, over the next three years, the fighting of the American Revolution disrupted classes at Yale, and twice Noah left Yale to join the local militia as they went to fight the British. Inside the campus, political discussions were feverish and impassioned. The future of the 13 colonies was in question. And if that wasn't enough, the faculty also called off classes for another reason, typhoid fever. Now, some good did come from these horrific experiences, however. It stimulated Webster's thinking along medical lines. And in 1800, he published a two-volume work on the subject of medicine and disease. It was a huge success and became a virtual textbook in medical schools across the country. And it became regarded as one of the most important works ever written on the subject by a layman. Now, the definition of layman means someone who's not a professional. I don't think that word applies to me. I thought we'd pop into the Alexandria Library to see what else we can discover about Noah Webster. So how did America's favorite wordsmith write his dictionaries anyway? Well, he would stand around a table like this one with dictionaries from all over the world open before him. Then he would ponder a word. Oh, I don't know, I'm thinking of the word ripped. Then he would pick up the Greek dictionary and look up the Greek definition for ripped. And after seeing a picture of me, then he would move on to the next one, the German dictionary, then the Arabic, then the Hebrew, the Spanish, and so forth. 20 languages in all. Now when he had collected all the information he could on the word he was working on, then he would write his definition. And speaking of definition, Shh. Sorry. It's fine. After eight long years, the war against the British came to a close, and the Americans had won the revolution. But now there was a nation to create, literally from scratch. We were not a united nation, and we desperately needed a stronger form of government. Noah confronted this problem head on. He spoke and wrote about the need for a stronger federal government and for more national unity. 
In fact, he became one of the first Americans to call for a constitutional convention. When the Constitutional Convention convened in Philadelphia, Webster was also in the city. He organized get-togethers with many of the delegates and participated in heated discussions about the weaknesses of the old government and the need for a new, stronger one. Some of his specific ideas made it into the new Constitution, and when it was finished, the delegates asked Webster to draft an essay in support of the new form of government which he did and then dedicated that work to the national hero Benjamin Franklin. Webster's essay galvanized national support for the Constitution and it contributed greatly to its later ratification and adoption by the states. Webster's vision for education in America was a purely American system of education, one that was grounded in religious and moral truths. Now this was a revolutionary idea, and convincing others of the need for a purely American system of education would be a daunting task, but Webster accepted the challenge. He therefore began writing such textbooks in 1782, publishing the first American spelling book where he introduced the American spelling of words, a book called The Blueback Speller. From the north to the south, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, Webster's blueback speller not only taught Americans how to read, but also standardized the language they spoke, taught them moral and religious truths, and unified the entire nation. Hi, boys and girls. It's story time with Uncle Davy, talking about the story of Noah Webster, the man who helped Americanize the English language. Now, Noah Webster was an umbunctuous type of feller. He was just fantastic in his adventures and contributions to American society. Now Webster, to my understanding, was not necessarily a boxer, nor was he Amish, and he did not have facial hair. Nevertheless, we're going to illustrate my point with this gentleman right here. How do you spell the word labor? L-A-B-O-R, right? Well, if you lived in England speaking the King's English, you'd put a little U in there. Well, Noah decided that U was a little extra, some extra nacious. So he decided to take the U out of many words like this. And that's how you spell labor. L-A-B-O-R. Labo. Labor. Labo. La Hold on a second. You know, reading glasses on. Tarnation. Now, boys and girls, how do we spell the word politic? We spell it P-O-L-I-T-I-C. But if you live in England, you spell it with a K. Well, what Noah Webster did was say, uh-uh, I don't think so. And took the K right off the end. Just like that. Oh, not again. Come on now. <laughs> he is one crazy little guy. Noah Webster published his last textbook when he was 81 years old. In it, he stressed the importance of persevering. When asked what contributed to his own remarkable vigor and long life, he listed four guidelines. Go to bed early and do not worry. Get up early. Exercise mentally and physically every day and keep a clear conscience void of offense toward God and man. Webster continued to produce his dictionary along with many other works for many years until finally in 1843, his life ended. His long and productive life proves him to be one of America's most brilliant and well-informed men. Now the school texts that Webster published also enjoyed widespread use for decades after his death. Some of those texts featured a picture of Webster and a phrase describing Webster as a man who, quote, taught millions to read, but none to sin. People don't talk that way anymore. Tracing just right, there you go. And it happened just like that.
Order the full set of Discovering America's Founders Special Edition at www.dthamerica.com or call 1-800-444-8828.